client computation and we are very much looking forward to the details. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful, thanks for giving me the chance to talk. So, uh, we start from five minutes late, yes. Yes, how many? <laughs> 40 minutes in a five minute discussion. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, so, what I want to talk about is how can we verify quantum computing, but let me give you quickly some motivation. The question is that how can we trust a quantum computer company? So, some company comes and says that I have a very good quantum computer, I make a good deal to run your simulation. How could you check that? Well, the easy solution is that, well, I'll ask them to run factoring algorithm, knowing that there's no classical computer who can do it. So I run, if it gives me the good factor, a number, the multiplied those number, so hence, he has a quantum computer, he or she or the company. But is this really enough? No, because this kind of test works only for a very specific problem. Basically, the problem that I in NP and is not known to be in BQP and don't go through the details. So the main question is that we don't know if all the problem that the quantum computer can solve is actually classically testable. So what, what we are going to do. So we cannot just ask a question and come back to this. So, so that's the question we want to tell you. And you can extend it a little bit to a bigger picture. Can we really trust quantum mechanics? So then you said that, of course, we have demonstrated all speed, but inequality, to ultimate uh, precision. Okay, there is some loophole there, but they have been demonstrated. So that shows that the prediction of quantum mechanics for few particles are exactly as we expect it to be. So, but but this is about few particles. And if you want to scale this thing, because I'm a computer scientist, you want to see how the complexity of such problems scale, then we cannot do the same thing unless the Hamiltonian that you're trying to make a prediction of it is uh, analytically solvable. Basically, the question is that quantum mechanics is happening in an exponential space. So the physicist will tell you that you know, whatever physics is working for few particles, should be the same when I'm making now 100 particles or 2,000 particles. Fine, it's going to be a very weird world if we change the number of particles and the scale and we go out of the quantum mechanics. But how do we do it? How do I, my dear friend, is going to run the experiment in his lab and is involving 100 or 200 or uh, thousands of particles? I cannot anymore run in a piece of paper the prediction and check, say, yes, Philip, you did really what you are claiming to do. So it cannot be done in that way, so we need to bring other technique to be able to do the verification. So basically, we want to answer this question, is nature classically testable? So this question can be precisely formalized in the setting of computer science with something is called interactive proof system. And Daniel Gottesman in 04, and then Aronson and Vazirani, they raised this question in a very precise computer science language that does any language in the class be QP? Is any problem that the quantum computer can efficiently solve it in polynomial time admit an interactive proof system, which is a prover, a verifier, such that that verifier is classical, is bonded to polynomial uh, time computation, which translated in language is can we classically and efficiently verify quantum devices? So the the maybe the new element is here that we want to emphasize on the efficiency because we're going to run uh, our classical machine or classical bonded resources to do this test? And the answer is yes, we can, but almost. I mean, a couple of slides I tell you why this is almost. And the answer is this. You can check our blog today. Finally, this paper is an archive. And uh, this is what you're going to implement for me. <laughs> for the number of qubits. So what I want to say, so let's, let's go ahead and make it a bit more precise. I'm going to spend some time to make sure that we are understanding what do I mean by verification. Uh, so some of you perhaps have seen this nice old paper of um, uh, Barnum and et al., which are talking about authentication. What's that? I mean, they call it authentication, but not a good name, actually. But so they said, imagine that you have Alice and... I need to focus on one of them. So let's pretend I'm here. So uh, imagine that you have Alice and Bob. OK, so Alice has some quantum state in hand, wants to send it to Bob but goes through this noisy channel, channel that Eves will interfere, okay? So how do they manage to make sure that at the end, this state that has uh, obtained is exactly the psi state? I mean, you don't care it's exactly coming from Alice, but it's exactly the psi state. So the solution was that what you do, you're using some sort of error correcting codes. If you have an n qubit message, you will encode it in a bigger space. And as long as they share the secret key, 
So that's what they need to have. They already need to have some shared secret key. Using that, they can detect whether there was an interference, very similar to the QKD idea. There was interference, so hence, this state is not the original state, or this is within some threshold is that. Okay, so that's, that's what they define. So, in a sense, the verification of quantum computer that I'm talking about um, is, is the same, where now my Eve, my nasty Eve is the same as Bob, because I have a quantum state that Alice has in mind, and it send it through this noisy channel. The only difference is that the channel is not only supposed to do identity, and it is performing a computation for me, a unitary computation or a general city map, and then I want to detect whether there was an error is, uh, appeared or not. So this is the way that I'm checking whether the server who provides me the service and is untrusted is really performing the information that I want to do. But you could see the similarity between the two approaches. So, and it's going to be very much similar that you pick up your state and the computation, you encode it in a bigger space, and now the sharing the key is easy because you can have a secret sheet key shared with yourself, and you're the only one who knows that, and then you, you're pushing it in order to detect it. So that's the big picture. Okay? Another way to look at this one, uh, which is pointed to me by Damien uh, Markham from Telecom Paris, is that it's also similar to the concept of steering. So in the concept of steering, so then again you have an untrusted party, Bob's, which is the same Eve. And what do they want to do? They want to go through the protocol so that they, so Bob is preparing some uh, bipartite state, could be entangled state, okay? And then it sends a, a part of that state, like in an entangled person, the one qubit to Alice. And then Alice are supposed to do some local measurements, some classical communication, asking Bob to perform some uh, sequence and send it back to me. And here, again, Alice at the end would accept entanglement or not. It's, it's a similar thing to the Bell inequalities, but instead of Alice and Bob and the third party giving that, now Bob is the untrusted one. So again, this go through it, and then there is a classical communication, and at the end you will accept, yes, this is state that Bob has prepared to me, and although I'm not trusting Bob, is actually an entanglement state. So, and there is like, you know, they, they, they show that it's how he's linked to um, Bell inequality and all those uh, verification, the, all those uh, categories. But in that sense, again, <coughs> the masking can be seen as a steering. So here, now Alice is preparing this bipartite state, if you want, it's like adaptation of the protocol. So now it sends something through this channel and it's getting again an output out of this channel and do classical communication during this thing given structure to, uh, to Bob asking question. And at the end, it accepts quantum computing. So this is, this is really, uh, analogy which is not have been yet made it precise and I'll come back to it if I have the time. But it seems there is interesting link and here we might be able to do more than just entanglement because of course we're asking more <coughs> in the instruction. But uh, as a result Alice is also having um, a bit of more requests you know, to be able to perform a single qubit measurement. So well, I'll come back to that but just want to give you the picture of all this steering, authentication, verification, uh, testing, they are all living in the same universe, okay? So, but let's go to my universe. So uh, what I'm precisely focusing is here. I want to have a protocol that in the case of correctness, I have these two properties called correctness and soundness. The correctness means that if nobody has interfered, if you have a trusted bot, a trusted server, okay? then Alice should accept, and the output should be exactly the correct output of your computation, your simulation, okay? And so it shouldn't be a protocol which all the time say abort, 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 abort. This, this, this is not very, it's very secure, but it's not really useful protocol. And then there is the soundness of it, that that's the, the target, that Alice should reject any incorrect output, except with probability at most exponential small and security form. And that's the typical classic, that there is always very, very, Epsilon that we should be able to control that Bob could be lucky, okay? And that's where we are going to step out of that initial picture that I was saying that if, uh, if, if you want to verify quantum mechanics by simulation, basically, okay, you run the experiment, give me data, and I check that one, that is so, so strong that we will be stuck. We're not going to be able to scale it to go to this exponential regime. This, this, this story, this story that I'm telling is a story that happened in the classical computer science that initially people were talking about 
and be problem. When you give me a solution, a witness, I check that witness and then I can solve it, but it's very restricted set of problem. And then they went to the interactive proof system that allow Bob, the server, the prover to do a little bit of cheating, but that cheating should be very bonded. And then suddenly the whole class of key space can fit to that picture. So it's a very, very essential element here, although we can tolerate, because we say now, I can tolerate to what extent this server might be cheating and might be successful, but that will allow us to overcome to this obstacle of exponential regime, and suddenly we can verify it. Because the method is no longer is about simulation, it's about testing and verifying it, as you will see. Okay, good. So now, I'll give you the intuition before I go through the details of the protocol. Uh, so some of you have seen this blind protocol stuff, so you'll see what I'm saying, but if you haven't, this is also fine. So there is measure-based quantum computing, which I hope everybody knows a little bit about it. So you have this general global internal state called cluster state or brickwork state, and you're running your quantum computation in your server on that one, okay? So how do I check my server is performing correctly? So what I'm going to do, instead of asking for something to come back afterwards so I see that if it's really the right result, I'm checking his behavior uh, during the protocol. So I'm putting some trap, and if that trap are not doing what I'm asking to them this way, so I, I detect him that he's not doing what I'm telling him to do. So the verification is, if you like, is like a process verification. I'm, I'm verifying that he's doing the process that I'm asking him to do. And the idea is that you put this sort of trap. So these are like an isolated qubit. And you can create isolated qubit by putting two of the neighboring in the state 0, 1. And these, 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 these words become clear once I go through the protocol, but you should be able to get the general intuition of it. So you're putting a single isolated trap in a particular quantum state plus theta, which is 0 plus e to the i theta 1, the uh, tilted plus uh, superposition state. And you add this thing in a random position. You put lots of this random position. And then there is a very simple property, is that if you have such a state, that you prepared with this particular angle, and you're measuring that particular, so you prepare a state and you're projecting in that state, then you should definitely get the result zero. You're not going to get result one. So I'm preparing in this state, and I'm measuring in that state, so it's no longer uh, probabilistic. I'm not getting two, two branches. I have to get zero. Or if I prepare it in minus theta, I, and I measure it, I should get to one. So if I'm throwing all this trap to Bob's computation, and Bob doesn't know what is that theta and what is that measurement, if he tries to not to do what he wants to do, then there is a probability that he gives me the wrong answer. Okay? So that's, that's the simple idea behind it. So the only thing that it, it becomes important, okay, so how do I put this trap position and all uh, completely hidden? So Bob doesn't know where is the trap, so try to well behave during the trap, and where are the computations, try to perform and do the nasty things there. So my, my methodology is that I'm putting a lot of trap. If Bob is making a misbehavior, touching this qubit, I'll cut him. And then they need to be enough, big enough, that although I don't check it for the rest of computation, I know that the computation is going through. So, so of course, if I want to follow such a strategy, I need to make sure the position of trap are unknown to Bob, so he doesn't know where I'm uh, trapping him. And this angle of measurement, because if he knows that, okay, this is plus theta, so I'm going to do the same measurement and he produced the expected result. So how do we do this trap position and measurement angle to remain hidden? That's the usage of the universe of line quantum computing that we need to expand it because we need to have the concept which is called line W qubit, which is respect or related to the zero one refraction. So this is a very, very general picture. And now I want to dive in to tell you Precisely because I never get the chance. I always talk about this thing. I never show you the proof of security or anything. So if there's any question about this general picture, you can ask now. Otherwise, I'll go to give you precise definition of the security. Okay. So universe of blind quantum computation. I'll go through it very quickly, just for those of you who haven't heard. So it's a protocol between Alice and Bob. It's like a client and server. So you have a classical computer. You ask this classical computer to augment it with the power of creating a random single qubit generator. So there is a device that whenever you plug it, it's, it will give you a random photon in some direction, and those directions are restricted to these seven, uh, to these eight uh, points. Okay. So 
no memory is required, no ensampling power is required. This is according to the blessing of the uh, experimentalist, the minimum quantumness that you can ask from, uh, from Alice. But compared to our original protocol, which was introduced with uh, Anne Rodman, Geoffrey Simon, and myself, uh, the protocol is now asking Alice to have a full classical computer. This is just a little tiny detail. Because in that original protocol, it was enough for Alice to be um, parity computation. Dan and, Dan and Janet have a nice result that for MPQC is enough to have only uh, parity L computer to do the full computation. But here, because of this verification, now you need to push up the power of Alice to have a full classical computer. And also, there is this random generator of 0, 1 qubit. So we'll be asking a little bit more on the quantum and a little bit more on the classical one. And then you send this initial qubit to Bob, which is going to prepare them in an internal state, and it's keeping them. And after that, you just do classical communication between Alice and Bob. And then you obtain the unconditional perfect privacy, meaning that Bob will learn nothing about Alice input, output, or computation. Okay. So how does it work? The, the way it works is the measurement based quantum computing. This model has a classical control machine, and there is a general quantum resources. The classical control machine gives you instruction of which measurement to be performed, and there is this adaptivity. So you just put Alice to be the classical control, Bob to be the resource controller, and then in order to do hiding, you need to hide the entanglement, angle of measurement, the result of measurement, and dependency. Can you very quickly, this is slide you have seen it, just to make sure that you follow means like, okay, if you want to make a measurement in the basis alpha, okay, but this way you reveal the information about the measurement. So the trick is that in quantum mechanics you can pre-rotate your state, apply this uh, theta rotation, and now the measurement in the angle alpha plus theta is exactly the same measurement. So this is, this is what quantum mechanics allow you, that, you know, I, I add a random rotation in my preparation, and later on I compensate for that by random rotation. So from Bob's point of view, it thinks that you're performing a measurement of angle alpha plus theta. Whereas in fact, you have implemented the computation of alpha. So if this theta is uniformly is at random is chosen, this way he has no knowledge about your angle. And then there's another trick that we need to do is that in order to make sure this result of that measurement is also completely random from Bob's point of view, you add the pi rotation. Because pi rotation is just flipping this outcome, and yet the computation is exactly what you want. So the computation is a implementation of some uh, unitary operator with the parameter alpha, but from Bob's point of view, the classical result of measurement is one time padded. The quantum measurement angle is one time padded. So he learns nothing. So by putting this element together, combining it, this thing you, you can build up the full uh, universal by quantum computing. The only new element is that now, how do we uh, how do we make sure that he's not learning anything about our entanglement resources? So we need to give a generic resource. So we sh it shouldn't be a particular graph which tells me which algorithm I'm implementing. In the original protocol, we give this brickwork state because it, it works, but now we need some, something else that you see because of the verification. So, so this is a little diversion, but it's like introducing a new universal result for measurement computing called double complete graph. So you pick up the, your complete graph of K4, uh, over each edge you add one node, and so this is double complete version of that graph. But what's the advantage of this? is that now any other graph state that you might want for a particular unitary computation you can do can be implemented out of poly Z and poly Y measurement. Because poly Z of any of these vertices remove that edge, poly Y remove that vertices. So I pick up this graph as my original generate graph. Now if out of this you want to implement a particular graph, you just remove or remain that edges. So this is from Bob's point of view, he's just giving this generic dotted complete graph. But by blind measurement of Z or Y, I'm actually engineering a particular resources that I need to, to have. Okay? So now, the only element, if you remember, there was this zero one, this blue vertices in the picture that I show you, which are, their, and their role is just to create an island, an island of isolation. So I have this big state that I'm doing my computation over, and I want to create an island of isolated that I will trap it. And I don't want this island to interfere with my computation. So how do I create an island of isolated qubit? I will put dummy qubit around it, which are basically qubit prepared in the state zero one, which make them disentangle from the rest. 
So the way it works is a normal blind computation. You pick up your appropriate size n, then you set up, you set d standing for dummy, it would be all the qubit, two things first of all. So all the sets d on kn, if you want to z measure the qubit, because we need to have some z measurement to create out of our resource as a particular resource, we don't really implement a blind z measurement by preparing a qubit in computational basis 0 or 1, you implement, implement the z measurement. So that's, that's the trick, because all our blind measurements are in the yz plane. So how do I add the computational basis blind measurement? I buy preparation. So I prepare the 0, 1. It's already disentangled. I tell Bob to measure it in some angle alpha, but it's exactly implementation of poly z measurement, which is very essential for the uh, things we see here later on. And then you measure them in some, some fixed angle alpha. So this is it. So if, if I know that a qubit is going to be measuring z, I initially prepare it in, uh, and it's, it's preparing in the 0, 1 state. If not, I'm preparing in this plus theta, with some modular correction. And then Bob prepared this one. He's uh, got the complete graph for us. And then Alice computes the angles. And in these angles, there are details. You need to look at the real computation you wanted to do with the initial rotation that you have done. This R pi rotation and the previous adaptive structure. But it's just a simple formula as you're doing it, and then both performs computation. So that's the normal way to include poly z measurement. So how do I take advantage of this one to put a trap? So let's remember our target is that there is this big computation is doing. I want to put just just to start for simplicity, just single trap. Somewhere I want to put a thing. You need to listen this precisely. Okay. So if you know one we have a last question for you later. So, so I want to make sure that there is a single trap somewhere there. And that trap position is completely unknown, and the angle of it is also completely unknown. Well, okay, pick at a random position t among all your vertices, put all the neighboring of that in your dotted complete graph to be your set d, which is preparing a 0, 1, and then set the measurement of dummy qubit and trap qubit to the 0, and then run the normal blind QC protocol. Now, how do I verify, how do I accept the output or not? It's, so if the trap, your trap qubit could be one of the, uh, I didn't emphasize this. The, the protocol could work when you have quantum output, you have classical output. If you are running a classical input classical output computation, everything will be measured. So there is not no quantum state is uh, meant. So, and if you have quantum output, then maybe some of those are trap qubits. So if the trap qubit is one of the output, because T was uh, randomly chosen, then Alice need to make a measurement in this particular one. And at the end of the day, basically, the value of the measurement of trap is my flag, is the abort or accept, uh, or accept or reject key. If the measurement outcome of the trap is exactly what I expected, because I know what it should be, this is the only measurement that I know what it should be, because I've prepared in a particular state, and I'm going to measure it in a particular state. So if give me that result, then I accept this protocol. If not, I reject it. Okay? Note that for all the other measurements, any result could be an accepted or rejected because measurement is uh, a probability. But this particular one is my flag on top of that. So now that we have this protocol, let's, let's go to give all those definitions that I show you seem to like authentication, it seems like a steering. So let's, let's, let's see precisely what is the definition of security. Excuse so, just, just a question. Sure. Slide. Yes. Uh, you mean Alice measures it? You mean Bob measures? It for Alice, or okay, it's a very good question. So in the, in the scenario that I don't have any quantum output, so all the qubits will measure, Alice has requested Bob to blindly measure that. Okay, so, But in the scenario that sometimes Bob at the end of protocol, so imagine you're running this blind protocol to a remote quantum state preparator, and then the Bob is supposed to give you a quantum state to you. Then it is possible that maybe the trap qubit that I've chosen is among those of them. And it's important because if you choose the trap always not to be part of the output, then Bob can cheat over the output and then don't touch the rest. So if it is the case that you have quantum output, and then hence one of these quantum outputs could have been trapped, Alice should measure it herself. But if you don't have any quantum output and everything can be measured by Bob, then Bob is measuring. Okay. <coughs> so, uh, I mean, even if you don't understand the details of it, you know, for understanding the security measure, it's just enough to understand this general picture. So, basically, what is the protocol? The protocol, Alice has some random parameter, some random parameter that's called and you not go through the details. And then, it, it, then the trace of computations, like in the language of like a trace of protocols, so they communicate classically and initially some quantumly and finally quantumly from there. And 
this B of mu is a branch of measurements computation, is a place of our computation, is the view of Bob of the computation. We represent it as a density operator, which includes the classical result of measurements that Bob has performed and produced, or, and also the quantum output. Okay, so B mu stands for the view of Bob or the run of the uh, trace of computation. And in here, once Alice is fixing these random parameters, then everything about, from her point of view, is deterministic. But from, Bob could do anything. I, 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 at this level, I'm not assuming, oh, Bob has obeyed the uh, step of my protocol. So I let Bob to perform any way that he wants, any deviation that he wants to do at adopting a whatever structure. So what do I want as the definition of my security? As we said, we want to have this property. For any choice of Bob's strategy, by strategy I mean any way that Bob decides to deviate, not obeying the rules uh, the, that I'm telling him, the probability of Alice accepting on average depending on all the random parameters that she is picking up, the probability of Alice being full, meaning accepting an incorrect outcome density operator, we want to be bounded by epsilon. This, this, this is the epsilon verification uh, definition we want. And as like, like anything in the security, just finding the definition took ages, and once you have the definition, then everything goes through. So, so this is the definition which is very much inspired by the authentication definition of uh, Barnum et al. So this, this is my density operator, which includes everything in it, in the sense that the classical measurement outcome, the quantum output, the flag, the accept, reject. Then I want to, what do I want to do? I want to make sure the probability of Alice being full is limited, is very unlikely. Also, I define in a second for you what is this. So this is the subspace of being full, subspace of incorrect outcome. So I want the trace of this one, on average of depending on Alice's strategy, to be epsilon bounded. Okay? So what is this subspace? This subspace of incorrect output is that when the, when the key, when the flag, is expected outcome, so it's RT because of the, uh, our rotation, but basically my flag which I'm ma making the basis of my argument is exactly the zero or one that I'm expecting, okay, so I'll accept, but yet the quantum output is orthogonal to the quantum state that I expect. So the Psi ideal is, Psi ideal is when Bob is exactly following the step of protocol, so it's creating for me this pure, and we know that in the case of the computation it's pure state. So now, so this is the subspace orthogonal to this ideal one. So this is where I have been fooled. Okay? The definition is clear. So, so, so that's, that's the case. So, so basically, we want to prove for our protocol that I showed you that on average, and why are we taking an average? Because uh, we don't want to, <laughs> it's obvious, but because you know, we, we don't have in the control of this random variable that Alice is choosing. So on average, this, this probability should be restricted. Okay, so then, then we can uh, prove that the very, for the very simple case, it's just enough to, to prove the concept for the single trap, and then you see that uh, I'll push it up. So the protocol that I show you, which has just one single position, some random position where all the neighbor was the Z, is 1 minus 1 over 2 n very viable. Don't worry about the rest, but there is quantum output or classical output. But the point is that if I have n total number of qubits, so this is the threshold that we get in. So this threshold is not very exciting because it's not exponential threshold, you know, it's, it's polynomial as, as it's known in the security, but you'll see how I make it this exponential in a second. But the concept is there, okay? So the concept is there and the proof of that I'm going through with this one is I already bring the idea up. So what is the proof? The proof is, is this basically. So this is a run of the protocol. In the MPQC, instead of showing it as a language of MPQC, I'm showing the run of this protocol in a circuit picture. The run of protocol is that well, there is some initial state that Alice has prepared in a particular state, send it to Bob, Bob is performing an entanglement, then Alice is choosing some particular angle, based on that is doing rotation and is doing a particular measurement. And now, look at this UI that I'm putting there. They are arbitrary de deviations. So Bob has an arbitrary subspace of his private qubit, zero, okay? And then I said, okay, Bob can deviate in any way that he wants. He can wait for this day to come and deviate before that measurement. And this deviation is at every stage that is coming. Okay, so this is a normal run, a particular run of my protocol, where Bob could have done anything that he wanted. Okay, the most general attack. Now, 
I'm going to make a simplification uh, that uh, security people among you will uh, start arguing, which is very good. But this is a very important uh, uh, simplification which allow me to push the security proof through. But maybe at the beginning it's not a trivial. I'm assuming this, this is a particular branch of computation. So I'm, like, I'm in the post-selected version where all these BI value are fixed. Hence my protocol is no, and it's no longer an interactive protocol because I fixed this value. And I can rewrite this circuit mathematically. It's no longer the run of the protocol. I can rewrite this circuit in this form. Okay? My UI deviation has changed. But what I have done, I have recovered an exact protocol that Bob is supposed to run and a big general deviation for a particular run. Okay? Here, I'm going to prove this uh, security property that I wanted for this particular branch. But I'm not going to make any assumption about what the U was. So if now, if I was in a different branch, if the BI was not in my control, then I would have had a different UI and different deviation. But because in the proof that I'm showing you, I didn't make it, I'm not showing you, don't worry. In the proof that we have, I'm not making any assumption to UI. That's why this is the proof for all the branches. Like we, can, we can discuss about this in detail, but this, this, this rearranging of the picture will allow me to put this big deviation in here in a sense Although the protocol is interactive, but I don't need to prove the interactive security, which is a nightmare. I, I can see it from the, this perspective of this protocol, it's not an interactive protocol. <coughs> I put my UI there, and then this big deviation, which is a general U, can be written as like a summation of all the polya uh, operator, and then I can, I can play with this polya operator, and finally uh, to get the low, uh, upper bound. So, the probability of Alice being fooled, accepting, and incorrect, that this is the probability of false positive. That uh, positive in the sense that I get the right track, uh, right uh, flag, I accepted the outcome, but the outcome is false. So the probability of false positive was this value, as we saw. And then by plugging this omega deviation in this form and putting everything there, and <laughs> playing around with this one, it took longer than my pregnancy. So you can get this, uh, this upper bottom initial as we want it. Okay, so after this, then everything, the, everything is almost uh, easy because then now we want to uh, amplify the probability. We don't like the polynomial security, you want it to go to the exponential probability. So in order to do that, then it's very similar to the probability amplification of the idea of the QKD. That in order to increase the probability of any local take OK, try to add as many uh, traps. So if your computation is of order of n, put up order of n many traps instead of a single trap. And the other very important aspect in order to get the exponential one is that you need to increase the minimum weight of any operator which is definitely making an error. So if I put an error correcting code, then I know that up to some threshold of up to D level uh, error, is uh, the error correcting will take care of it. So even if, if Bob is trying to deviate a little bit, then it's not going to be detected because, you know, the error correcting will take care of it. Now Bob needs to do a big deviation, and hence, because he has to do a big deviation, then there is a high chance that I will detect that big deviation. So you put this thing together, and you get me it. So, and that's, okay, okay, nice, the idea is that, but now there is a challenge, because now I need to put a lot of trap, but if I'm putting a lot of trap, this big gigantic cluster that I have might be breaking down, and there is not enough space to run my computation through of it. There is a trap that you need to play, and that's why the dot of complete graph comes to picture. So the protocol is the following now. Imagine you have this quantum circuit, and you want to run the verifiable version of this quantum server, and, and this quantum computation on the server. So first thing you do, okay, this circuit is basically it's very easy, the standard method, that this is the graph that you need to run your computation with. Okay. So I can create that graph out of my dot, dot of complete uh, K5. So I create the K5. And for any edge that it need, uh, shouldn't be there, I do Z measure. For any edge that it should be there, I do Y measure. All of this blindness. Okay. So I have a mini, um, mini pattern which takes me from K5 to the graph that I want to run the computation. Then I need to pick up two other copy of the K5. Okay. And I use this one copy to make all of these original vertices to be an isolated track by making everything Z measure. And I pick another mini pattern and I make all of the black one too. And that's important because this way Bob cannot know, oh, I know the nodes which are on this, this particular position are the trap or the nodes which are there are the trap. So now everything could be trapped, okay? 
but I have this tree copy, a tree copy here. So how do I put things together? I'll show you in a second. But another important thing because of the fault tolerance, so this, this is taking care of creating many, many traps of order of the same size of my computation in a random position. To do the fault tolerance, when I'm doing this, in fact, instead of going back to the plot that I need, I'm creating out of my dotted complete the 3D lattice of Rosendorf, Harrington, Goyal, topological and operating code, which have effectiveness D. This is what we pick up off the shelf, okay? So these people have created a wonderful fault tolerance scheme which works directly for the measure based model. You just give them what graph you want to do fault tolerantly and which security parameter you want, okay? So you need to create a particular 3D. So I have this universal resource, so out of this, I adjust my measurement angle to give me that particular one. And now I'm putting everything together. By what? By, by creating, I had, a, I had three copy of K5, so I need to have dotted complete version of K15. This is where Philip is looking very, very upset. <laughs> this is nice. And then what do I do? Okay, so from Bob's point of view, I have these this generic resources. Now, I randomly choose a partition because Bob is not supposed to know where is my computation, where is my white trap, where is my black trap. So I randomly pick up a partition and then by adjusting those that measurement, yes, I'm reaching to the end, thank you. By adjusting those measurements, I can create the blindly three copy of K5. So it's a, it's a huge waste of the qubit. Okay, but this is just proof of concept, and I don't think this will be ultimately the protocol. We need to, to work on it to make it improve. But this is just proof of concept that from a generic resource, I can create blindly three of this one. Now, one of those will be the black trap, one of them will be white trap, one of them will be computation. And Bob doesn't know which one is which, and now I overcome the challenge of I've cut my resources so much. So this, this is the way the protocol is going to work out. And then you, you can prove the security parameter is a constant value C to the parameter D. So depending on how much threshold you want to tolerate, you choose your thickness of the topological or corrective code accordingly. Okay, so let's go to perspective. So what we have demonstrated, we have demonstrated we can efficiently verify quantum devices either with a trusted single qubit generator. So either in the version that I show you, well, my assumption was that Alice is able to create the single qubit which are trusted to, to our device. So this, this is what I start with, it, and then we can efficiently clar uh, test that this device is really what doing it, doing it. Or the thing that I didn't show you but it was in our original paper is the two version as an entangled version. So we can do everything that I said in the scenario that you have two entangled ball which are not classically communicating, and now Alice can be completely classical. This is very, very much similar to the usual setting uh, that we have. So, in a sense, in a sense, maybe they are equivalent: like a single qubit generator, non-complete entangled. I don't know. So we have these two versions. So now, what's the interesting open question? It's here: is that what is the lower bound? Do I really need to have this single qubit generator or this non-committing server? And Blatko was written in this uh, perspective article recently that apparently yes, you need to have a bit of quantumness to verify quantum mechanics. And as his former student, I have no choice but to prove him wrong. So, so that's, that's the case. And that's the uh, question that Vajirani raised, that actually maybe there is a way that you can completely classical devices without request of this trusted single one. So I think that's, that's a very, very interesting question. Or if you cannot do it completely classic, get a lower one. You know, right now, the number of qubits that we are creating need to be of order of the computation we're doing. Could it be like maybe some constant qubit is enough or not? So those, those are all the questions. The other thing that I also didn't talk is that the link of the verification and interactive proof systems is bringing a new way of looking at some open problem of complexity theory. We did something regarding the quantum <coughs> multi interactive proof system with entangled server and we showed that actually the quantum verifier doesn't give you any extra power. You just need to have a classical verifier. So this is helping you to upper bounding there and and the other direction, it seems to be very interesting to go to the quantum zero knowledge because blindness is already almost giving you the zero knowledge. So if you can do this blindness in the both side of Alice doesn't learn anything about Bob, Bob doesn't learn anything about Alice, then you can push it there. And also, I mean, I just touched it, and it seems that there is some link with the steering and how we can all that jazz. Thank you.
Sure, question here. Um, so I'm interested in the uh, non commuting non communicating entangled servers uh, yes. protocol. But I, I'd like to ask a question about perhaps unfairly, about a slightly different scheme and okay. I wonder if you've addressed it. Um, supposing there are there are these two servers, but the way that I'm guaranteeing some non communicating between them is I'm not going to tell each of them who the other is. So I can't presuppose entanglement. So now there would need to be some communication between them. So imagine the model where Alice um, channels all the computation through herself. In other words, she, she calls Bob 1 and she calls Bob 2. She doesn't tell Bob 1 and Bob 2 who each other are, but she allows them to communicate to each other through her. Is it then possible in that kind of Well, in, in the paper with the market that we put in the AKLT scheme, and also because we also, there is, there is this, we, we, there is an advantage that we brought it to the AKLT scheme, which is better than cluster state, but we were bringing the same issue that okay, asking non-classical communicating is, uh, is a lot. So we're just arguing that like, you can imagine that in the future you have, is a long answer, but I will come precisely to what you say. But we also assume that, like, let's imagine that we are in the future, there is many, many competitive uh, quantum company, okay? So they, they need to be trusted because otherwise Alice will decide, okay, I'm not going to work with you anymore. You're not a trustable one, so I'm going to work with the other one. And then the idea is like that. So you somehow have entanglement, None of the server knows that who are they having with, and then Alice is broadcasting. So like everyone measured in this state, everyone measured in that state, and this part. But we don't have a precise security uh, analysis of that. We think that is the method can go through it, but obviously I don't think we can get the exact blindness in such a scenario. Or maybe I'm wrong. But it seems that because because eventually the argument should be that if if they decide that all of them collaborate together, they can get some information. If eventually some of the Bobs know that I'm, I'm working with the other Bob and is running the computation. So, but but if, if such a scenario can be pushed and precisely analyzed, that would be wonderful because because then it makes sense because the Alice is completely classical and yet you don't ask this uh, okay. like a very strong so, so argument. So the situation at the moment is there's no known proof but no, no go theorem. Yes, okay. that's the precise yeah. situation. More questions? Mike, yes? Is there a simply intuitive reason why I can't, why it's not sufficient to have a, a statistically significant number of trap qubits in the computation? Why, yes. Why do I need to go order n? Uh, order of n uh, is important because, um, well, okay, there is two elements. If you're just putting uh, just trap and you don't go, so maybe I'm answering a question you're not asking. Well, if you didn't put the full tolerance in the picture, okay? Then, then you, don't, you don't get the exponential of that because you always have some sort of order of n. So I think it's, uh, going to order of n is not such a, such a big deal. You know, you could put less of it, you get some sort of constant. But the main issue is to get this parameter d go to the power. So, so probably the number of trap is just we did it in order to get exact constant. But we know that in, in method that okay, it's not constant, and then, then you just run this um, uh, over time, and as long as it's like bonded above uh, one is fine. But the parameter D is very, very important. And we don't have done any, we haven't done any precise analysis. And as I said, this is just proof of concept. It would be very nice because right now we are wasting a lot of resources. If we can analyze these things, that would be, that would be nice, yeah, probably. Can okay, I take the chance for a last question? So actually two questions are really related. So the first is that it seems that hidden local communication is part of the game because you have this kind of user state and it seems that you have this they have shown this vortices and yeah. this kind of cross vortices and you play the game that by applying this by achieving that the, 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 the switch to base without knowing what is happening above you just by basically hidden local communication. Okay. Yes. Moving ahead means okay that's a yes to the answer. Yes. Second is um, in, in a real life scenario you would like to achieve that the computer has no idea, okay? But then they can achieve that computer is not cheating on you with the result. Yes. They use this trap to Mm -hmm. Does that mean that you have a huge overhead in terms of classical communication? Because it seems to me that, in it, it says for me, the computer not works that you send something, he does the computation of the measurements, but he keeps all the results to himself, so just get the final answer and says, okay, that's the answer, and keep it to my client. What? But he continues yeah. to send every measurement outcome to the yeah. principal yeah. bank, because otherwise, if you send me the fifth, people, he goes, oh, of course, that's the cheating guy, so here, to do my job. Yeah. So I think the overhead, the answer of overhead, yes, right now, overhead is linear. Okay, so if your computation is of size m, it's still linear, 
but in the real scenario that the qubit are very precise, it's like there is the overhead. You need to send all this qubit. So if you want to do three qubit computation, you might sometimes need to do order of the n, but like 20 qubits. But you need to do all those measurements. So, but but there must be some sort of other clever version of encoding so, uh, to go through it. Yeah. Okay, thanks.